Morning friends, it's so good to see you this morning and I trust you've had a great weekend and even looking forward to the, the holiday tomorrow, Monday being the public holiday. So I want to talk to you this morning about Mark chapter 4 where Jesus extends an invitation for you and I to discovery. It's a beautiful picture of him inviting us to come on a journey with him to and discover what the kingdom and abundant life is like all about. So it's a beautiful invitation. In verse 24 and 25 of Mark chapter 4, Jesus says two things. The first one, he says, listen with open hearts. So it's amazing how Jesus says, listen with your heart, not your physical ears. And the second thing he says, be diligent with your understanding. So it's not just the ability to understand, but be diligent with what you've understood. So it's amazing how Jesus says, listen with an open heart, and be diligent with your understanding. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel Jesus is a little bit vague here. He doesn't say what we need to listen to or understand, because he wants us to find the truth. He wants us to go search for it. Matthew 13, 44 to 46 is a beautiful expression of go find it like hidden treasure. Go find it like a pearl of great price. So there's something in the journey or the invitation of discovery that God wants you and I to play a part in, to go look for it, to go search for it, to go and study it. To, it's like paging through encyclopedia after encyclopedia of the life of Jesus to understand how he responded in situations. What does it look like to have abundant life according to Jesus' standard? So go find the treasure. So Jesus is extending an invitation to accompany him on a journey of a lifetime. It's a fully paid up discovery trip. It'll bring a new level of excitement to us every single day with surprises around the corner and the ability to experience and explore places that we've never been to before. Sounds a bit like a holiday advert. Maybe come and explore the Maldives or come and track the Himalayas. There's something of an invitation that pricks our attention to say, okay, God, what are you calling us to? What does it look like? So it sounds like a holiday advert to me, but in a sense, Jesus is saying, come, come and inv come on. I'm inviting you to come and have a look at what abundant life can be like with me. So Mark chapter four starts off where Jesus tells the story about a farmer who sows seeds. And we know that the seed falls on four different areas. First one is that it falls on the gravel path where the birds eat the seed, which means the devil causes you and I to doubt the truth. Number two, the shallow soil where it grows no roots. And so without endurance, our hearts fail. Among the weeds is the third place that the seed falls and we know that they grow together and the weeds choke the seed. And it's the worries of the world that cause you and I to choke up. But then it also falls on good soil and it produces a crop of 30, 60 and 100 fold. The parable starts with a farmer sowing seed and it ends with a harvest. It starts with a cost and it ends with a reward means the journey of discovery for you and I must yield fruit. So I love that picture because not only will it give me memories and photographs of my holiday or my experience in the journey, but it actually bears fruit. Jeremiah 33 verse 3 is very clear and it says, Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and unsearchable things. So things that we might not understand and see, but when we listen with our hearts, he gives us and he reveals to you and I unsearchable things. So the invitation to discovery continues in Mark chapter 5, where Jesus heals a demon-possessed man. We know the story where he sends the demons into the pigs. Pigs rush off down the valley and they drown, or down the hill and they drown. But the fundamental part is when that guy said yes to the invitation of Jesus, he evangelized 10 cities and changed the spiritual atmosphere over that region. Then in Mark chapter 6, Jesus sends out the 12, and I love this, two by two. So we never have a ministry that is on our own. Jesus always sends people out two by two. Even when he sent out the 72, a little bit later on, he sends them out two by two. 
In the same chapter 6, Jesus is, uh, feeds the 5,000 and there are 12 baskets of leftovers left. In the same chapter, Jesus walks on the water. We know that story. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus teaches on inner purity. Isn't it amazing? And he said, listen with your heart. Then he teaches on inner purity and he heals a deaf man. Then in Mark chapter 8, Jesus feeds the 4,000 with seven baskets left over. If you enter Numbers, 12 signifies the 12 tribes of Israel and that Jesus was the bread of life bringing them salvation. And seven is the fullness, which means Jesus is the bread of life for Gentiles as well. So on the one hand, the gospel is for the Jew and on the other hand, the gospel is for the Gentile and both signif significant in the two parables of feeding the four five thousand and feeding the four thousand it's a beautiful picture <clears throat> excuse me and then jesus goes on after that and he he gets into the boat after feeding the four thousand and he crosses over the lake but as he lands on the other side the pharisees kind of storm him and they start to demand a miracle from him and they're argumentative immediately jesus gets back into the boat and leaves it's an amazing story if you ever look at it and then in verse 15 jesus says to the disciples while they've left now and they're on their way back across the lake jesus says to them be aware of the yeast of the pharisees so jesus invites you now to a discovery of abundant life and what it is like to live in the kingdom realm and in the middle of all this four chapters of him expressing the kingdom so that it kind of whets our appetite and gets us really excited, he then stops and says, but don't forget about the yeast of the Pharisees. So I don't know about you, but that kind of raises the question inside of me. So God, what is the yeast of the Pharisees? And we can find it in Matthew chapter 16. It provides the answer. And it says, at last they understood that he wasn't talking about yeast in bread, but he was talking about the deceptive teaching of the Pharisees. And so we can conclude that yeast of the Pharisees is deception. So you and I need on the journey of discovery with our God, be aware of deception. So it's a journey of studying, a journey of looking, a journey of learning, but at the same time to be aware of deception. You see, deception can creep into our lives to rob, kill and destroy, as we know. So deception, number one, erodes your confidence and cultivates doubt. Number two, deception frustrates the ability to endure and it prevents you and I from being an overcomer. It also produces worry and robs us of our joy. And number four, deception can prevent a harvest and destroy your ability to produce a crop. I'm going to repeat that once more because I want that to understand what deception can do to you and I. Number one is it can erode your confidence and cultivate doubt. Number two, it can frustrate your ability to endure where we give up too easily and it prevents you from being an overcomer. Number three, it also produces worry and it robs you of your joy. And number four, deception prevents a harvest and it destroys your ability to produce a crop, to bear fruit. So I want to have a look at those four qualities that you and I need to cultivate in our hearts to guard against deception while we are on the journey of discovery with our God. There is so much to discover in our walk with the Lord, not only of what he has done and the battles that he has already won for us, but how we walk blamelessly in front of him and how we walk in such a way that our hearts are invigorated and excited when the newness of his abundance is expressed to us, where we experience his love, his peace and his joy. It just brings about something that changes the inner man of you and I. So the four things, the four qualities that you and I need to cultivate to guard against deception on our journey of discovery with God. And the number one is confidence. I don't know about you guys, but have you ever bungee jumped? Well, I recall my first jump. And I, st I remember standing on the bridge 
feeling extremely confident until I put on the harness and I climbed over the railing and then everything seems to change. The confidence you have gets eroded because now you're standing on the other side of the railing where there is just nothing in front of you but a drop and the river seems very, very, very far away. And I remember standing on the side of the bridge holding on to the hand railing that my knuckles were so white with the pressure and the big grip that I was exerting. But I'm trying to say that confidence on that side of the hand railing compared to a loss of confidence on this side of the railing is where, is where we can learn. So confidence is built on who or what we trust. My trust was on the bungee cord not breaking. So I remember after 10 or 15 or even 20 minutes of standing on the other side of the hand railing with my knuckles white holding on, trying to rebuild the confidence in the bungee cord and everything else. But when I did let go and when I did jump, the exhilaration and the feeling, you just can't imagine. But I had to regain confidence. I could quite easily have climbed back over the railing and not have jumped at all and missed out on a lot. And so the invitation that God calls you and I to is to have confidence in Him no matter what we face. Because if we face trials, if we face tribulations, if we fa face heartaches and hardships, it is easy for you and I to climb back over the railing to a place of safety where I'm confident in my own ability instead of standing on the other side and taking that jump. And there's something in the discovery or the journey of discovery or the invitation of discovery about the abundant life with God that we do not have to be caught by surprise. Because Jesus has overcome every fight, every battle, everything that you and I could face. So for me to build my confidence in God means I study His Word and I spend quality time with Him conversations with my God to understand Him and to understand His ways. The Bible says that you and I should be cultivating God confidence, not self-confidence. So I don't put my confidence in myself and my own ability, even in my own understanding. I put my confidence in God, even when it seems absolutely ludicrous or impossible. So my question to you this morning, friends, are you trusting in chariots and horses or are you trusting in the Lord? You see, chariots and horses in today's terms might be, are you trusting in other people's opinions? Maybe you're trusting in self-help books that you've read on marriage. Maybe you're trusting in get-rich-quick schemes. We've seen them all over the internet. Maybe you have been trusting in how to grow your business in three simple steps. So do you put your trust in horses and chariots? Do you put your trust in get-rich-quick schemes? Or are you putting your trust and your confidence in God? So friends, for me to stand on the wrong side of the railing, I needed to regain my confidence in the bungee cord. But also, you and I, in our journey with God, we need to put our confidence in Him. He is our bungee cord that will never fail. He is our rock on which we stand. He is the one that, I'm, that plants me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He's the one that says, I'm a planting of the Lord, an oak of righteousness. So when I understand that, that God builds confidence in me, and when I look to Him, I grow in confidence then the invitation to discovery and an invitation of the journey excites me and exhilarates and whets my appetite to want to know Him more. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So what might seem logical to you and I in the natural, in the things that you and I face, we put that thought aside and we pick up the Word of God and say, Father, what is your perspective on this issue? That is how you and I grow in confidence. Because He imparts to you and I, He downloads into our spirits His confidence. 
And when I grow in his confidence, I'm able to, as I said a few weeks ago, climb a wall and scale a wall and go through a troop. So with my God, confidence rises in me that everything I face, I can overcome. So the second point, <coughs> excuse me, comes, number two is overcomer. So a quality that you and I need to cultivate in our lives to guard against deception is that the spirit of an overcomer. A fully dressed soldier fitted in the latest military gear, shoulder pads, arm braces, chest guards, helmets with a 3D with the with a infrared camera on the top and the correct weapons is a formidable picture of an overcomer. So Paul used the same picture as an illustration in Ephesians 6, which I spoke about last week, about putting on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the enemy and his deception. So we put on the full armor of God as a formidable force against the enemy so that we can guard ourselves against his deception. Overcoming evil with good is how Paul instructs us in Romans 12. He says, in other words, do not fight fire with fire, but we fight with every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord, Deuteronomy chapter 8. That is how you and I fight. And so to be an overcomer, we get our confidence from the, from the Lord, we dress ourselves in the armor of God, and we're able to advance against the enemy and overcome. In Revelation 12, Verse 11 says, we overcome by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. You see, friends, Jesus' finished work on the cross has dealt with every issue you and I could ever face in life. He dealt with every lie. He dealt with every trial, with every tribulation, with every amount of stress that you and I could ever experience in life. Jesus has overcome it all and invites you and I onto a journey of discovery with him so that you and I can overcome even now. If we live from a place of kingdom to earth, then we live and we function from a place of overcoming so we can bring that to our situation here on earth and see the kingdom of God advancing. Jesus overcame Every battle the enemy tried to throw at him, Jesus overcame, dealt with them all, once and for all. He is seated in heavenly places next to God on the right hand side at the place of honor. When you and I give our hearts to the Lord, the Bible tells me that I am now seated in heavenly places with Jesus. So I function in my spirit man from heaven to earth. I overcome by the testimony and the blood of Jesus. I overcome every argument and pretense that sets itself up against the word of God because Jesus has already overcome. So I can look back on history and say, okay, Jesus, that's how you overcame. With strength and with fortitude, I can do the same. So friends, understand there is no battle on earth that has the better of you and I. If we function with our ears and our mind, we get lost and stuck in the battle. But when we listen with our hearts, and we start to respond with confidence in Him, not in our ability, in His ability, we know that we can overcome every problem, obstacle, hill, mountain, valley, darkness, whatever it is that you and I are facing, we can overcome. Friends, understand this, that victory is assured even before the battle begins. If we start from that place, knowing that every battle has already been dealt with by Jesus and his perfect sacrifice on the cross, then we understand that we can be fully assured that even as I enter this battle, it's already been won. The Bible tells us that we will go through the water and it won't cover over our heads. It will go through the fire and I won't get burnt. So it does mean we're going to go through trials. We're going to go through problems. We're going to experience stress. But with my God, I can overcome. 
and with my God. So I keep my eyes fixed on him. I keep my heart focused on him and his ability to overcome. And as I adopt that into my life and understand it, I can start to walk in victory knowing that every battle has already been won. The battle is mine, says the Lord, in 2 Chronicles 20 verse 15. I've heard many people say, bring your problems and lay it at the foot of the cross. Bring your pro problems and pin it or nail it to the cross. And I understand that because the blood of Jesus, sacrificed on the cross, overcame everything. So when you and I face an issue, we bring it under the blood of Jesus and say, Jesus, the word of your testimony and the blood of the Lamb has already settled this issue. Help me understand my part in seeing this thing uh, dissipate in front of me so that I can overcome it. Number one, to cultivate a quality to guard against deception, growing confidence in God. Number two, be an overcomer because of the blood of the Lamb has already achieved everything for you and I. Point number three, the third quality that you and I need to cultivate is joy. So how do we enjoy life when most of us are under stress of all kinds of forms? Your stress might be financial restraints or constraints. What about stressing over your kids, your job, your spouse, the economy? What about the future of this country? All of those things could be causing you to stress and lose your joy. But right now, friends, God wants you in the middle of the storm to enjoy life. In the middle of stress to find the sweet spot that makes you enjoy life and resuscitates the joy in you. You see, right now, God wants you and I to enjoy life because our conscience is clear. My conscience is clear because Jesus has dealt with everything I could ever face. Because I'm secure within God's love. And because I can have fun and laugh in church. God wants me to enjoy life because I can enjoy my friends who don't manipulate me. So there's various ways that you and I can look at it to say, I'm enjoying life right now, even in the middle of a stressful moment. Because I understand that God wants me to enjoy life. The world is constantly looking for joy. The next thrill to bring some kind of relief from chaos. And we understand that. The, the world is constantly looking at, at something that's going to make us laugh to bring relief from the chaos that we constantly are bombarded by, especially by the news. And I don't know about you guys, I am sick and tired of watching news because all they do, and this is not new, it is old, it's been done for thousands of years, they only, only tell you about the negative stuff. And I'm so tired of it. But fortunately, we can put our hope in God. I love 1 Timothy 6 verse 17, it says, He provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So God wants you to experience joy, even in the midst of troubles and trials and stress. He wants you to enjoy life. So may I say this, if you're not having fun right now, maybe ask God why not. He'll tell you. But I want to say that even in the middle of a stressful time, even in the middle of trials, you can still smile, knowing that Jesus has overcome everything, knowing that your confidence is in Him, and that He's already won the battle before you even enter it. That's got to bring us joy. Studies have shown that when we have joy in our lives, we are more productive. The book of Philippians is only four chapters long, but Paul uses the word joy 16 times in four chapters. The amazing thing is that Paul did not write the book of Philippians while on holiday in Mauritius. He actually wrote the book of Philippians while in prison in Rome awaiting execution. So Paul's in prison, he's facing execution, and from that place he writes the book of Philippians. Four chapters long, 16 times as he mentioned the word joy. Six things. For you and I to, to cultivate or practice that lifts depression so that you and I can enjoy life. Number one, get rid of stuff that's wearing you down. You want to experience joy? Get rid of stuff that's wearing you down. Identify it. If it's wearing you down, it's costing you energy, making you grumpy, 
Get rid of it. Number two, break off all worry. It's the number one joy killer. Find God's purpose for your life. Number four, spend time with God on a daily basis because the joy of the Lord is my strength. I find strength in the Lord my God no matter what I'm facing because His joy brings me relief. Number five, give back. Get involved. Might be getting involved in our local church, lots of social programs that we're running. Might be getting involved in, in something at your, at your place of work. Whatever it is, give back. Get involved in something that uplifts local communities. And number six, tell somebody else about Jesus. So there's six things for you now to do to lift depression and enjoy life. Number one, get rid of stuff that's wearing you down. Number two, break off all worry, because worry is the killer of joy. Number three, find God's purpose for your life. Number four, spend time with God on a daily basis. Number five, give back, get involved. And number six, tell somebody about Jesus. Restore your joy by acting on those six points. The fourth thing and the last point is to produce a crop. A fourth quality that you and I need to be able to guard against deception while we're on the journey of discovery with our God is to produce a crop. Galatians 6 verse 7 says, Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. If we want to enjoy an abundant life, we have to invest in it. We have to invest in an abundant life. And we invest in it by spending time with God on a daily basis, by getting rid of stuff that wears us down, by breaking off worry, by finding God's purpose for our lives, by giving back and getting involved, and by telling somebody else about Jesus. That's how we invest in producing a crop. The farmer in Mark chapter 4 sowed seeds, and at the end of that parable, he reaped a harvest. You and I need to sow seeds. Galatians 6 verse 8 says, The one who sows in the flesh will reap corruption in the flesh. But the one who sows in the spirit will reap in the spirit. Friends, our choices matter. The choices we make in life do matter. Because it depends then on, on the, what is being cultivated in my heart and in my life. If I have sown in the flesh, I will harvest negative thoughts and negative patterns of behavior. But if I've sown in the Spirit, our lives will harvest abundant life. So that even in the middle of stress and trials and tribulations, we can find time to laugh. So, so friends, Jesus invites us on a journey of discovery. Matthew, sorry, Mark 4, 5, 6 and 7. He invites us on a discovery of, of life. He teaches us and he shows us what it's like to trust in the Father, to see miracles happening. And then he reminds us, be warned against the yeast of the Pharisees. So he invites us on a journey. Number one, cultivate confidence in God. Number two, overcome by knowing that the battle is already won. Number three, find joy. It'll change you. And number four, go bear fruit. Let us pray together. Thank you. Father, I pray for us as a local church, for Victory Church in Craddock. I pray, God, that we would cultivate confidence in you, that we would overcome by knowing that the battle is already won, that we would find joy because we know it will change us and we will be able to go and bear fruit. So, Father, I pray for us as a community that not only will we be able to be joined together in unity, but we'll also be able to cultivate qualities that guard us against deception. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. I hope you're great. I hope you're good. I hope you have a good day today. And we see you very soon. Thank you very much.